shall be the policy of this nation to regard any nuclear missile launched from Cuba against any nation in the Western Hemisphere as an attack by the Soviet Union on the United States, requiring a full retaliatory response upon the Soviet Union. I call upon Chairman Khrushchev to halt and eliminate this clandestine, reckless, and provocative threat to world peace and to stable relations between our two nations. Conflict and Compromise, the world on the brink. During the latter half of the 20th century, the United States was involved in a conflict known as the Cold War with the Soviet Union, which reached a climax in October of 1962 in the form of the Cuban Missile Crisis. The Soviet Union's premier, Nikita Khrushchev, and President of the United States, John F. Kennedy, would struggle to reach a compromise through shadowy communications and secret missives resulting in the culmination of the 13 most dangerous days mankind has ever faced and the closest humanity has ever been to nuclear annihilation. The Cuban Missile Crisis started when American operators flying U-2 planes over Cuban airspace spotted missile sites and missile transports in La Coloma. This struck alarm in the United States government as Cuba was just 103 miles off the coast of the mainland. To add on to all of that, Cuba had been parlaying with the Soviet Union and were undergoing a transformation to communism, an ideology the United States had sworn to contain wherever possible. This stems from the power vacuum created between the Soviet Union and the United States after World War II. The aforementioned vacuum was the uncertainty of what to do with Germany after their defeat and the not yet military battle between the United States and USSR over which state had the most power, as well as ideological differences the U.S. being capitalist and the USSR being communist. Although war would never break out, the two powers would come dangerously close to overstepping their bounds and causing another globe-spanning conflict. This was best showcased when the USSR attempted to bring Soviet missiles into Cuba. The United States had been running state-sponsored terrorist activities and sabotage missions called Operation Mongoose, or the Cuba Project, to covertly dismantle Cuba's government after it began to convert to communism and had allied itself with the Soviet Union. After much conflict and strife, the U.S. had received reports that the Cuban peoples and militias were ready to oppose Castro and overthrow his regime. This initiated the Bay of Pigs, an American attempt to overthrow the Castro administration using untrained Cuban militiamen and rebels. This attempt failed, and the reports that the people wanted Castro usurped were false. Castro became desperate and would have compromised anything to the Soviets for help. After spotting Soviet missiles in Cuba, John F. Kennedy called together a board of his most trusted advisors, including all regular members of the National Security Council, Robert McNamara, Secretary of Defense, Robert F. Kennedy, the Attorney General and Kennedy's brother, and McGeorge Bundy, the National Security Advisor. Many other people attended these secret meetings, but few were so crucial as this group. These meetings were secretly recorded by the Kennedys, and it is very unlikely that the remaining members knew they were being recorded. Further espionage was committed regularly, and the process of nuclear missiles being constructed in Cuba were well known and well documented. Kennedy was faced with a dilemma. How could the United States possibly remove these missiles from Cuba? And more importantly, how could they compromise to avoid a military conflict with the Soviet Union? In the midst of the most dangerous 13 days man has ever faced, Kennedy found himself presented with two options, an airstrike and invasion of Cuba, or a military blockade, later coined the Quarantine. On day three of the crisis, the Soviet foreign minister, Andrei Gromyko, arrived in the U.S. to assure Kennedy that the Soviet activity in Cuba was only to establish defenses for Cuba, and not an aggressive act. Kennedy informs him of the gravest consequences of Soviet military buildup in Cuba, however. On day five, the quarantine was approved and plans were started. Kennedy prepared a speech to inform the American people. I have directed that the following initial steps be taken immediately. To halt this offensive buildup, a strict quarantine on all offensive military equipment under shipment to Cuba is being initiated. All ships of any kind bound for Cuba, from whatever nation or port, will be found to contain cargoes of offensive weapons be turned back. Soon after plans were drawn, they were put into place. Kennedy moved to approve the blockade with the Organization of American States and the UN. The blockade is approved and American fleets move into place, but meet conflict with Soviet submarines. 
all Soviet sea travel halts, except for a lone ship, the Bucharest. Kennedy attempted to reason with Khrushchev in a letter on the same day pleading, we will be discussing this matter in the Security Council. In the meantime, I am concerned that we both show prudence and do nothing to allow events to make the situation more difficult to control than it already is. Kennedy also requested that the Soviet transports containing military supplies be halted immediately. Khrushchev fired back at Kennedy. I must say frankly that measures indicated in your statement constitute a serious threat to peace and to the security of nations. The United States has openly taken the path of grossly violating the United Nations Charter, path of violating international norms of freedom of navigation on the high seas, the path of aggressive actions both against Cuba and against the Soviet Union, and that you, Mr. President, are not declaring a quarantine, but rather are setting forth an ultimatum and threatening that if we do not give in to your demands, you will use force. Tensions grew ever higher as both sides battled for a high ground in the conflict. On October 25th, the 10th day of the crisis, it was known to Kennedy that some nuclear missiles in Cuba were now operational, and action had to be taken. He penned a letter to Khrushchev pleading for the course of action to change. And on the 27th, after no action had been taken, Robert McNamara remarked, I thought it was the last Saturday I would ever see. Kennedy faced great pressure from his advisors to take military action against Soviet SAM sites after Major Rudolf Anderson was killed piloting a U-2 spy plane surveying Soviet missiles, but he refused to attack Cuba. Kennedy finally received another letter from Khrushchev demanding a tough compromise. The Soviets would remove their missiles from Cuba as long as the United States promised never to invade Cuba and to remove Jupiter missiles from Turkey, a bordering country to the Soviet capital. Unbeknownst to the Soviets, the Jupiter missiles in Turkey were actually obsolete and were soon to be removed anyway. The United States accepted this offer and a non-invasion pledge was signed publicly. The Jupiter missiles, however, were removed secretly, out of view of the American public. The official end of the crisis spurred much change around the world. Kennedy was applauded and met with a hugely positive public outlook. His actions during the crisis were seen as level-headed, cunning, deft, and morally superior to the Soviet Union's. The United States sought to avoid conflict, resolve the conflict through compromise, and at the same time, retain the power to disobey international law or other conditions that we impose on the powerless. A frank and welcome expedition of operative assumptions, reflexively taken for granted by the XCOM assemblage, according to Matthew Iglesias, a respected historical and political commentator. Khrushchev did not come out as well. After breaking the trust with Cuba by dismantling defensive missile sites in the region, relationships with the country were poor and unstable at the best of times. Hardliners in the Soviet government could not stand the fact that Khrushchev solved the conflict through compromise and began efforts to remove him from power. They succeeded in 1964 when Leonid Brezhnev and Alexei Kosygin usurped him and began a massive military buildup, undoing the weapon dismantling Khrushchev had done. Then, less than a year later, both nations, still shaken by the severity of the crisis, signed an agreement to stop above-ground nuclear testing. Later, in 1968, the nation signed a non-proliferation treaty and agreed to reduce production of nuclear arms and to prevent smaller nations from looking to nuclear weapons for the security of their state. Although Kennedy's actions had saved humanity from the nuclear fire and from itself, sabotage operations continued in Cuba. The United States had come out on top in this all-encompassing conflict, but the threat of a communist Cuba still remained. Discussions were had of another attack similar to the Bay of Pigs invasion, and an overthrowing of Cuba's government through U.S. military intervention. This goal would never be reached, as Kennedy was assassinated shortly thereafter on November 22, 1963. Cuba would remain a communist state, defying the United States Containment Doctrine. After facing the threat of a true nuclear holocaust, the world's collective head turned to eye non-proliferation and to find a compromise to avoid facing the same threat of utter annihilation ever again. <laughs>